And uh, I want now to come to the next presentation, which is given by Professor Bruno de Geest from Ghent University. And he's a pharmacist, but with a strong chemical background also. And he's active in the field of yeah, the use in polymer chemistry to develop uh, interactive materials that can guide and modulate the immune system. So we are very much in this topic of yeah, nanoparticles and the immune system. Yes. Please start. Thank you so much for the introduction, for inviting me. Uh, first of all, I'm not a chemist. I'm not a pharmacist. I'm a chemical engineer, but uh, that's a, <laughs> a small detail. So uh, in my lab, we are working at interface between uh, materials chemistry and uh, immunology. And uh, in particular, we have an interest in engineering interaction between immune cells and cancer cells to eradicate uh, cancer. So I think this is uh, one of the holy grails in a cancer immunotherapy. Uh, let's imagine a patient has a cancer. Maybe we could inject something into this cancer. This generates an immune response in the sentinel lymph nodes. And this immune response is then uh, amplified throughout different um, lymphoid organs and leads to the eradication of the cancer. And this could not only be practical, for eradication of uh, solid primary tumors, but could also be used for the eradication of uh, metastatic growth. So I think we are uh, far from there yet, but let's see uh, how far we can get uh, in our lab. So imagine this is a solid tumor, and this is the sentinel uh, lymph node. So I, our idea was how can we uh, activate innate immune cells, so typically uh, dendritic cells, DCs, uh, and macrophages, in the tumor uh, microenvironment to then induce a systemic uh, immune response that can uh, attack uh, this, uh, this tumor. So a uh, first step would be to locally activate innate immune cells in, in the tumor microenvironment. These innate immune cells would then uh, migrate to uh, sentinel uh, lymphoid uh, organs. Their activated uh, dendritic cells should present tumor antigens uh, to T cells. These T cells would then uh, proliferate, expand, and home to uh, tumor tissue where they can recognize cancer cells and eradicate the cancer cells one after uh, the other. So our first question was now, how can we uh, safely activate innate uh, immune cells in uh, the tumor micro uh, environment? So to activate uh, dendritic cells, uh, one can trigger uh, a series of uh, receptors. So we uh, worked on triggering a toll-like receptor. So these are um, receptors um, that are activated by uh, microbial patterns, such as uh, viruses uh, or, uh, or bacteria. And uh, we developed an interest in uh, toll-like receptors 7 and 8. So the natural ligand uh, of uh, TLR7 and 8 is a viral um, RNA. But there are also a number of uh, small molecules that have been discovered that uh, are very potent activators of uh, toll-like receptors 7 and 8. One of these molecules is imikumot. It's, uh, it's on the market. Uh, it's called Aldara. It, it's a cream. It's uh, used for treatment of uh, warts and, and keratosis, but it's only suitable uh, for topical uh, applications. So you have to put it uh, onto the skin. So what would happen if you would uh, inject uh, imikumot uh, into a to living animal? So we uh, used a uh, luciferase reporter mouse for interferon beta activation, so uh, in, uh, inflammatory uh, signaling. This is a mod model developed in the group of uh, Stefan Lindenklaus. So uh, every time that uh, interferon beta is produced, luciferase is produced, and you can do uh, luminescence imaging. So we injected an uh, imidzokinoline uh, TR78 agonist in the food part of this, uh, of this animal. And as you can readily appreciate, you get inflammatory responses uh, throughout the whole body of this uh, poor little animal. So uh, we, we wanted to uh, change the pharmacokinetic profile of, uh, of this molecule. So um, the concept uh, that, we, that we worked on, developed uh, by uh, actually in the lab of uh, Professor Tzentel, it is a coarse cross-linked um, micelle. So it contains of, of a stealth uh, corona, a hydrophilic uh, core, which is uh, cross-linked, with a degradable cross-linker to be stable uh, under extracellular conditions, but to degrade uh, upon uh, stellar uptake. And we also uh, covalently conjugated our TLR agonist to the core of these particles. So if we take a look at the structure of uh, imiquimod, there's no 
uh, chemical function that can be used for covalent conjugation uh, without uh, abrogating bi the biological activity of this molecule. Uh, so we um, collaborated with a group of uh, Sunil David at the University of Minnesota. So Sunil is a medicinal chemist who specializes in structure activity relationships of all kinds of uh, immunomodulatory molecules. This is one of his... Uh, it's going to go back. Yes, and this is one of... Damn it. So this is one of his uh, most potent uh, molecules. It's called uh, IMDQ, just an abbreviation of uh, imidoquinoline. And it has a primary amino group that can be used for conjugation without killing the activity of uh, the molecule. So briefly, this is the chemistry we use. So we use uh, raft polymerization to have a block of polymer with a polyethylene glycol metacrylate-like um, hydrophilic block and an activated ester uh, hydrophobic block. So sulfophobic interactions between these activated esters drive a uh, Meissler assembly that is then used for covalent attachment of our TLR agonist, degradable uh, crosslink. So we use this, this ketal chemistry, which is also uh, shown um, now by Rudolf Stock, and then we modified all unreacted uh, activated esters with amino ethanol to have a hydrogel uh, nanoparticle that should be uh, degradable in response to an acidic uh, pH. And that's indeed what happens. So if you take these particles at uh, pH 7.4, uh, you measure a size of uh, roughly 50 nanometers by DLS. If you expose them for a few hours at acidic pH, you only measure uh, the size of uh, soluble unimers. These particles are also uh, taken up uh, by dendritic cells uh, in vitro uh, to a higher extent than soluble polymers made from uh, the same uh, material. They're also uh, capable of activating uh, dendritic cells. So we took uh, bone marrow uh, derived dendritic cells. The TLR agonist in soluble form is highly potent, so it leads to activation of dendritic cells uh, irrespective of the concentration range that was used in this experiment. Uh, in case of the TLR agonist conjugated to nanoparticles, we lose some activity at uh, lower concentration, but we regain activity uh, at higher concentration. Then we uh, went in vivo to see whether these particles are also capable of inducing innate immune activation um, in, uh, in the tumor microenvironment and in the sentinel uh, lymph nodes. So we injected these particles directly um, in, uh, into the tumor, and we used the same luciferase interferon beta uh, reporter uh, mouse model. So we grow a tumor subcutaneously uh, in these animals, and then performed peritumoral uh, administration uh, of either the TLR agonist in soluble form or nanoparticle form. So as you can really uh, uh, appreciate here, uh, injection of the TLR agonist in soluble form induces um, an inflammatory response of the whole uh, volume of this animal, whereas uh, nanoparticle conjugated TLR agonist only induces immune activation in um, tumor microenvironment. Also, it's important to, uh, to highlight that only innate immune cells can be activated by this type of compound, so are really activating uh, the immune uh, system here and not just um, cancer cells or, or uh, other uh, kinds of stromal cells. And this is also translated if you look at uh, the numbers of uh, different blood, uh, blood cell subsets in, 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 in circulation. So administration of the TLR agonist in soluble form leads to a significant decrease in all of these uh, key um, blood cell subsets, whereas the uh, administration of the TLR agonist in nanoparticle form has much less detrimental um, effects. So really reducing systemic uh, toxicity by conjugating these TLR agonists to a nanoparticle. Are these particles also uh, transported uh, to lymphoid uh, tissue? Yes, they are. So if you inject these particles subcutaneously, they massively translocate to the draining lymph nodes. Whereas if you take polymers uh, that are uh, hydrophilic, prepared from the same type of material, they are barely uh, transported to the lymph nodes. Uh, this is not uh, a kinetic uh, phenomenon, because if you uh, do this experiment at two different uh, time points, on uh, every time point, particles are outperforming uh, by several orders of magnitude um, soluble polymers. So you really need uh, a, a particle-like system or an anthelic-like system uh, to target lymph nodes. With soluble polymers, you're not getting there. So are we also activating dendritic cells uh, in, uh, in lymph nodes? So uh, here we performed an experiment where we um, grow uh, a tumor, we injected uh, our different formulations into the tumor and then looked at uh, maturation markers 
in the draining lymph nodes, and this shows that the TLR agonist in soluble form and in nanoparticle conjugated form is equally potent in activating dendritic cells in the draining lymph nodes. So you are abrogating the systemic uh, inflammatory uh, effect of these agonists, but you are still uh, retaining its uh, um, uh, immune activating potential in uh, the draining lymph nodes. So actually the, the place where you want to, to be. So last question uh, in this um, more mechanistic uh, uh, study that we performed, uh, are we also in using um, proliferation of tumor-specific uh, T cells? So to, to answer this question, uh, we grow uh, B16 uh, OVA tumor. So this is a melanoma cell line that is uh, overexpressing uh, ovalbumin. So in this case, ovalbumin is seen as a tumor antigen. And then we performed adoptive uh, transfer of uh, ovalspecific uh, CD8 T cells and looked at proliferation um, of these cells. And both in the sentinel lymph nodes, so locally as well as in the spleen, which means uh, systemically, you get um, uh, strong proliferation of, uh, of these T cells. So really getting a an, an systemic uh, anti-tumoral uh, immune response by locally injecting these TLR agonist nanoparticles uh, into a tumor. The anti-tumor uh, effect, so again, we uh, grew a tumor. This was just a B16 uh, melanoma. We performed different, uh, we performed multiple uh, uh, treatment uh, regime, and we monitored uh, tumor growth as, as a function of, of time. As you can see here, both the TLR agonist in soluble form and the nanoparticle form uh, induces a strong reduction in uh, tumor growth as a uh, as function uh, of time. Again, we are not outperforming um, the, uh, the effect of a soluble agonist, but at least you are equally potent and we fully abrogate systemic um, inflammation. We ask ourselves, can we uh, further improve upon the system? So we uh, tackled two different uh, issues uh, in, in, um, with regard to the effectiveness of uh, tumor immunity therapy. So first of all, the immune suppressive environment. Therefore, we uh, combined our treatment with uh, immune checkpoint uh, in inhibitors. Uh, secondly, we wondered whether we can increase the number of innate immune cells uh, in the tumor and in lymphoid tissue. So therefore, we used uh, FLT3 ligand, which is a, a cytokine that um, uh, induces proliferation of dendritic cells uh, from the uh, bone marrow. The slide is a bit overcrowded, but it shows that uh, the blue curve here is the, uh, the single treatment of uh, TR78 agonist uh, nanoparticles, which gives a strong decrease in tumor growth relative to the PBS control. But if you combine this both with immune checkpoint inhibition and with FLT3 ligand, you get more dendritic cells uh, in the tumor, also in the, uh, in the draining lymph nodes. Here in red, you get in the, an additional and significant um, re uh, reduction in tumor growth. It's also uh, visible on, uh, on histology, where we see increased numbers of uh, DCs, so in red, and uh, CD8 T cells in green uh, in uh, the tumor tissue. So these are uh, the take-home messages. So conjugation of a small molecule uh, immunomodulator to uh, a nanoparticle induces um, very potent lymph node targeting. It restricts immune activation to the draining lymph nodes and also uh, reduces uh, systemic uh, toxicity. Local administration of such nanoparticles into the tumor microenvironment uh, provokes immune activation in the tumor and in the sentinel lymph nodes, induces tumor-specific uh, T-cell responses, and also has a therapeutic uh, anti-tumor effect, and it also has uh, the opportunity uh, for combination immunotherapy. So I have to thank the people who did this uh, research, especially uh, Lutz Noon, who is now a group leader in, at, uh, at the Max Planck in, in, in Mainz, uh, and our collaborators, and the people who funded this research. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for keeping in time, and we have time for some questions. Please. No. Nice talk. I was not so sure if the anti-tumor response was also using the OVA expressing tumor cells. No. So the okay. only experiment here that uh, involved the overexpressing cells was looking at the uh, T-cell proliferation. In all other experiments, we just used uh, plain B16. Yeah. Thank you. Because and I can, I can yeah. think that if you use B16 over, you have a very strong uh, tumor antigen, it would be better, but we didn't. Uh, 
thank you so much for your nice talk. I wonder if you have worked on metastatic melanoma model too, or? Excellent question. We are going to do this very soon, but we didn't do it yet. So. Very nice presentation, Bruno. Um, I would also like to come back to the issue of the antigen. Um, eventually, I think uh, you might want to move away from intratrumoral injection to systemic application, and then you do need some sort of source of antigen, tumor antigen. Would you aim for using peptides or rather RNA-based approaches? So in our lab, we are going to try peptide-based approaches, although I must say the mRNA field has evolved very far. So I think they're beautiful work, well, including work that you have co-authored. So uh, I think it's worthwhile to pursue both approaches because you never know where you are going to end up. But I think the mRNA field is, has advanced or evolved very far at this moment, no doubt. Okay, the last I, I have a more general question. So how important do you think the PEC, or the PEC coating is in such intratumoral applications? Is it really critical or should it even be maybe negatively charged? It all depends on what you want to achieve. But everybody that does intratumoral injections still use pegylated materials. Is that necessary? <laughs> is it logical? It's, uh, it's a good question because uh, we have now in two to three more iterations developed new materials that are much more simpler than these um, corticose linked particles. And still we are thinking about using PEG or something hydrophilic, um, in particular because when it's super soluble, it's not reaching lymph nodes. So it should be at least amphiphilic. And then I'm not sure whether PEG is important or not. Another thing which uh, puzzles me a bit, so if you are delivering an immunomodulator uh, together with PEG, and PEG is known to generate antibodies, you will generate enormous uh, anti-PEG antibodies. So this can lead to, uh, um, uh, to shock. So I think actually moving away from PEG might be a good idea if you are coupling it to a, to a TLR agonist. Something okay. we'll try soon. We'll discuss it in the coffee break. So thank you very much. Thank you.